All right, everyone, welcome, welcome everyone. to lecture three. So before we get into the actual content, we have some announcements to make. So yeah, so first off, sorry, Tyler. Uh, first off, good work to everyone who completed the first two assignments. You know, it was it could have been a lot to finish those two assignments, um, especially with the delays in the kits. So thank you to all those who got them in. Uh, just remember, you do get seven late days. so. Um, you'll be able to use that. And we're also feeling a little generous uh, with the extensions, wink, wink. Um, guys better get excited for that costume contest this Saturday. We're so, so excited to see what you guys come up with. Like, I honestly can't wait. Uh, if you didn't see, we posted the link to the submission form and the, just the general rule outline on Piazza this morning. So take a look at that, get your submissions in and yeah, we'll, uh, I think, we'll look through them all. I think some other non micro mouse actually officers are inquiring about the costume submissions they're like has anyone submitted yet so uh yeah so we released the uh, form i think last night yeah so or this yeah, morning uh, this morning uh, so uh we're excited to see what you guys come up with for that yes yes um another thing i triple e is the host of the West Coast's largest hardware-based hackathon called Idea Hacks. It is a lot of fun. Um, they send, they're going to send you parts this year and you'll be able to make something and win some cool prizes. So definitely apply. It's a great experience. It looks great on a resume and it's just a really fun way to spend a weekend. I would highly recommend. Um, I, applications are at ideahacksla.com um, and you can find them around. That's the, uh, if you see the graphic for it, that's on the right side of the uh of this slide it's a it's a very exciting opportunity um another thing join a gb this is a general board it's a program ieee has where basically you get to hang out with officers officers aren't that scary we're pretty fun um just come out hang out learn from us be social it's a great way to uh learn a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes of micro mouse and ieee in general um i joined last year's micro mouse's leads gb um, it was a great experience. I got to see what's going on. So if any of you are looking potentially to pursue any officer positions, um, doesn't have to be a project lead. It could be, like there's a lot of officer positions like corporate relationship, cor corporate relations, like treasurer, event planning, events coordinator, all that, all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, definitely come to the come to the info session, which I believe is next Thursday. Um, Tyler, do you want to talk about memes? Um, there's an IEEE meme page. Uh, it's a triple I, I don't know. Um, they're, they're in need of a original content. And at our officer meeting last night, uh, the administrator was like, hey, we need a recruit. So um, we haven't worked out the details yet, but we're going to probably have a contest for electrical engineering slash maybe micro mouse related memes. And then, uh, We'll, we'll figure out some prizes for that or something. I don't know. Uh, point is, uh, for any of you who uh, are particularly skilled in this area, um, look, we need help. OK, we would so very much appreciate some nice quality crispy memes. Oh, boy. OK, so I think, uh, yeah, that's it for announcements. So, so today we'll be talking about what I think is a uh, very interesting and exciting topic. Uh, we'll be talking about PAD control. So what it is and how we specifically apply it in MicroMouse. All right, so PAD control is what we call a control system. So all, all a control system does is it takes input and feedback from sensors and then uh, it does some smart magic to determine what to do with it and produce an output that helps your system achieve some goal. So to make that a little more concrete, in MicroMouse, we have a couple different sensors as inputs. So your encoders and the infrared sensors. And then uh, what then the outputs that can be changed are the speed and direction of each motor. And then there's the, then the target is drive straight, don't hit the walls, and then a little later we'll talk about solving the maze. Okay, so 
let's uh, let's make this a little more. Uh, let's I'm going to use an analogy here. So um, let's let's say uh, you were tasked with walking along a line drawn on the ground. Let's not uh, well, we're not going to get into why you would find yourself in a situation to be compelled to walk along a line on the ground. But um, so let, let's say what happens here. So your eyes, they see the line. Uh, and then you see, oh, am I deviated in the, from the line? Am I lined up? Your brain takes in that information and then decides where to put your next, where your next step should be. So, um, and then it keeps doing this almost continuously. So as soon as you move, your eyes see, is so my foot placed? Am I still lined up? Keeps checking this over and over and over really fast. So there's this feedback loop. And if everything is working properly, uh, you don't get a DUI ticket. So um, yeah, so that's just an example of what we mean by feedback loop. It's that process of it taking input, doing something with it, output, do it again. Okay, so now a um, little bit about how that's actually implemented. So and the example I just gave, it's your brain is the computer, but here we have a microcontroller. So uh, our MCU has a feature called SysTick. So uh, fancy term, uh, it's just, it runs once every millisecond. So a thousand times per second, it's gonna check the encoders, infrared sensors, figure out uh, how far it is from where it needs to be, and then adjust the motors accordingly. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how PAD it's implemented, but let's, uh, we've just been calling it a black box so far. So let's talk about what actually happens. So PID consists of three sub controllers. So namesake, uh, proportional integral derivative. So these are some scary calculus terms, but uh, you'll, as you'll see shortly, it's not actually as complicated as it might initially seem. So uh, the, each sub controller takes in the error value. So the error is just the difference between the current and targets, target state. So uh, just to make that a little more concrete. So let's pretend this red triangle was trying to get to the gray finish line uh, in a straight line. So uh, its current location, it's not on the, it's not at the finish line yet. So there's some distance error. And then in addition to that, it's not lined up initially. So there's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of angle error. Bradley, admit someone from waiting room, please. Okay. So um, yeah, so that's that's all we mean when we say error. So each of these three subcontrollers, they're going to uh, take that error and do something with it. So the proportional controller, it's going to just take the error, multiply it by some constant. Uh, the integral controller is going to take the integral of your error over time, multiply it by a constant and your derivative term, uh, guess what? It takes the derivative of your error and multiplies it by a constant. So uh, this constant, uh, we'll talk about how the heck you find it uh, shortly, but that's what we call the gain of each individual controller. So once you have all these controller outputs, they are all added together. And then this, uh, this uh, summed up Output uh, is your control signal to, and then you, that controls your output in our case, our motors. So uh, before we move on, so the goal of this whole thing, remember, is to manipulate the output so that the error becomes and stays zero as fast as possible. So uh, this, this was a bunch of text flying at you. So let's, uh, uh, Let's does anyone real quick? Does anyone have any questions about that? Um, how do you how are you feeling about this so far? Yeah. Okay. Your silence as that Tyler's doing an amazing job of explaining things. Exciting. Okay. So let's uh yeah, let's break this down a little more graphic or visually. So uh, you have some uh pretty moving squares here. So before I get into explaining what the actual, uh, like what the math and numbers mean. So let's just, for sake of analogy, let's pretend each of these colored squares is a 
car and their the goal let's, let's say they're just trying to pull into a parking spot in front of them which is center centers on that line so um the uh and what they're able to control is they have a gas pedal so they can control their acceleration forwards and say backwards and then they have a another like a gas pedal so they can uh break they can yeah so um let's see so we look at these different squares uh the which which so, someone tell me which one uh which one of these squares does the best parking job probably the critically damped yeah the red one right so um the red one it swoops into the spot stops right where it needs to driver can get out go shopping or whatever um okay great so the magenta and the yellow one doing okay the yellow one gets a little slower magenta gets a, the blue one like the guy's bumper is probably completely messed up he's like pulling into four spots in front of him or something i don't know <laughs> yeah um the green one uh i don't know so anyways uh let's take it from the the analogy and talk about how that has anything to do with pid so let's say the the gas pedal is our is related to our proportional term so the farther you are away then uh you're gonna step on the gas a little more and then it's going to uh and then you're going to accelerate forwards so um the think of the uh, gain of the so kp in this case think of the gain as our um think of that as how sensitive the, your car is to uh being far away from the line so as it gets closer the air gets smaller and you let up on the gas pedal but your car has inertia it's gonna if you just slam on the gas move forwards get to the line then your your foot's off the gas but you have inertia gonna overshoot like blue so uh, the next step is uh, you need to use your brakes so the derivative term it's not perfect analogy but just for sake of example let's say this has to do with our uh, let's say that has to do with the brake pedal so the higher the kd term is the uh, more uh, damping there will be or the more sensitive the brakes will be to how fast you're approaching the line so as you if you're approaching the line really fast then you need to, you better step on the brakes, otherwise you're gonna uh, overshoot a bit. Okay, so if, if you can, the numbers, the colors are probably not the easiest to read, but um, if you look at green, KP is zero, so uh, and it's not moving, so there's it's deriv the derivative of the error, which is how far it is from line. That's not changing because it's not moving, uh, so it doesn't matter what KD is. KP is zero. Which, and it's far from the line, but it's multi anything multiplied by zero, it's not gonna move at all. So it stays still. And everything else, uh, these terms are set so that they hopefully arrive at the line in a controlled manner. So uh, what you might notice here is uh, there's no I term in the previous example. So I'm um, just gonna go on a little adventure here, talk about why that's the case. So, um, the I term, uh, you can think of it as a, it gets rid of what are called steady state errors. So um, let's say, uh, yeah, so if the, uh, so if you're driving straight on a road and there's a, and you're trying to stay straight, and there's a strong crosswind, that's, that would be a persistent error. So you're not, it's not just the isolated system, there's some external force that's persistent. So I think this, this little, we're going to watch a little video segment that kind of explains that use, using the same car analogy. So um, let's say you're in your car and you're trying to drive right beside your friend who's moving at a constant speed. In this case, the reference signal is the position of your friend. If the output of the controller is a pedal angle, it's easy to see that there's going to be a steady state error and you will always trail behind your friend and never beside him. Imagine this. You're some distance behind your friend and you're both going the same speed. In that case, you have an error signal that looks like this. And since the error isn't changing over time, remember that your speeds are matched, the derivative path is zero. 
And let's assume that the error in the proportional path causes you to press the gas pedal down to its current location. In this situation, you're not going to move the pedal at all, and you'll continue to drive behind your friend, since your velocities will still be matched. So now you might be thinking, maybe your proportional gain isn't high enough. If it was, you could go a little bit faster and catch up to your friend. If you increase the gain, then the proportional path will cause you to press the gas pedal down to a new lower position. And you'll drive a bit faster catching your friend. However, as you get closer, the error gets smaller. And so you begin to release the pedal, causing the car to slow back down again. So by increasing the gain, all you've done is shorten the distance between you and your friend, which is the steady state error. But you haven't removed the error. You can easily see the flaw in this thinking by assuming you start out at the exact speed and location as your friend, and you use a PD controller. In this case, both the proportional and derivative error terms are zero, so you immediately release the pedal and start slowing down. So by controlling pedal position and using a proportional derivative controller, we have no way of bringing the steady state error to zero. Now this is where the integral path comes in handy to remove steady state errors. When you are trailing behind your friend and the error is constant, the integral path will slowly build up error, adding more and more pedal to the output. It works like this. The error starts out constant, just like it was before. And just like before, you're holding the pedal exactly where it already is, and you're trailing your friend. But since the error term is non-zero, the integral path is summing up that error over time and gradually increasing the pedal's position. Eventually, as you close the gap with your friend, the proportional term will be zero since there's no error. You're exactly equal with your friend. The derivative term will be non-zero since you're closing the gap with your friend, but if you're closing slow enough, it won't have much of an effect on the output. But the important thing is that the integral term is going to be held constant at the exact pedal position that you need. And this is how all three terms are used to control a large variety of control problems. And I use this car example to illustrate it because most people can relate to it and you can actually imagine the system reacting to different controllers. Okay, so hopefully that was, uh, oh, what's going on here? Let's say you're in your car and you're trying Awesome, love technical difficulties. Oh, and there we go. Okay, we're back. So um, I hope that gives a little, that makes it, I hope that kind of gives you some intuition as to what the I term is doing. So um, if you look over here, so if our if the parking spot was moving uh, somehow, then um, you would need to keep you'd need to uh, that's a steady state error. So the I term would need to increase. But um, there's it's not very applicable to MicroMouse, so. The previous two slides were just to show kind of uh, what, what um, why you might use an integral term, but it's not, but in MicroMouse, you don't need one. Tyler, by the way, we can see the, uh, the video control thing at the top of your screen. Oh, you can, perfect. Um, also, just before we go on, I just wanna make sure we're doing okay. And I know sometimes people don't really wanna speak up. so. Uh, wouldn't mind just answering this poll real quick, just so we can do a quick little uh, sanity check, to make sure everyone's keeping up. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. Yeah. So the KP and the KD terms, yes. those aren't actually constant, right? In the system? Um, let's see. I, I think what? I'm a little bit confused because like in the, the color diagram, they're right. just constants, but are they actually constants in the actual system or no? Yes, yes. those are constants. Um, so they're constants that we determine experimentally. So you play around with them for a little bit and then basically as, as, you, as you figure out what constants work best, those are just, yeah, they're just constants. Okay, let, let me, okay, it'll be a minute, but let me briefly explain, so. What, what what this is so this proportional term so we use the car analogy but uh, what that is is um, when you when you start far from your target uh, you're going to have uh, there's going to be some error 
And then uh, as you get closer, the error gets smaller and it's gonna be zero when you get to the line. So that error gets multiplied by some uh, constant and you experimentally determine that constant, but yes, cat, it is constant. Then the derivative term, yeah. What, what I was gonna say, if you want to think of it as like, uh, if you're like, if you're driving a car, like there's some people who will like floor it as soon as they like, as soon as they see that they need to get somewhere. And there's some people who will like accelerate, like press the, be very conservative in how they press the ga gas pedal. Like the KP is like, related to how fast like how you react to that and that's just like in the same way that like one person will react different from another at like a normal like a at a constant value it's it's, it's kind of like that if that helps at all yeah so then we're just playing around we're manually like tuning this constant to find the critical damping of the system basically yeah um okay. well there's one more analogy layer that might be a little more helpful in uh, the uh, debriefing what that means. Then the derivative term um, that's related to how fast you are uh, approaching the line. So if you're, uh, if you're moving really fast towards it, then the rate of change of how, okay. So th think of it like this. So uh, in physics, like displacement is X and then your speed is how fast that's changing. So that's just the derivative of it. So let's, if you're going, so that's just how fast you're going. So if you're going really fast, then you need to apply the brakes as you get closer. So that's another way to think about what that means. Okay. Uh, okay. Bradley, tell us about yeah. rotation. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, PID is just a control system. Uh, we can use it for all kinds of things. And um, if you notice, uh, in Micromouse, your maze isn't just a straight line. Uh, if it was just a straight line, that would be pretty boring because then you'd just be making a robot that just drives straight. But, you know, there's there's curves, there's corners, you have to navigate through it. So we need a way to basically say, I want to turn 90 degrees, and then your car just turns 90 degrees. Um, so yeah, we can use PID for that because it's just another system where we have a goal state, which is how far we want to turn. We have a way of measuring our air, which is um, how much we've turned, and we need to adjust the two. Um, so here, uh, our error, instead of being our difference in how far we've gone versus how far we want to go, it's the difference between encoder counts of the left and right wheel, because that difference corresponds to how far we've turned. Um, yeah, so we just add our correction to one motor, subtract it from the other, and then that allows us to turn and adjust how fast and how far we are turning. Um, you may be asking why this is necessary. Uh, Obviously, we need it to turn, but we also need it for when we're driving straight. And in, in a perfect world um, where everything's good, everything's perfect, uh, you just set your motors to the same value and they just go forward straight um, at the same rate. But as you've probably noticed with playing around with your motors in this past assignment, if you set your motors to the same PWM value, they're going to turn at different rates. And sometimes we, yeah, we, or actually always, we don't want that because it's going to cause your car to veer off to the left or veer off to the right. Um, because if we're driving straight, we're just taking the average between those and that doesn't take into account the differences between that. Um, so as a more concrete visualization, basically don't you don't want this. This is just setting your car to say like drive straight and uh, you know it'll 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 veer off the path. Okay. So exactly what's happening in this little GIF I made. So I set both motors turn forwards at 0.4 to the cycle, but almost right away, it starts veering off to the side. So um, James says, isn't it different motor rates a steady state error? Yes, you could use an integral term to correct for that. Um, but again, this is to illustrate why you need a controller. Integral term implies you need a controller. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so just to uh, summarize what we've said in a more mathematical, mathematically rigorous sense, uh, you can see the equation at left is basically what we're doing here with our calculations. E of t is our error value as a function of time, uh, depending on whether we're using our driving straight controller or our rotational controller. That E of t is calculated in two separate ways. If you're driving straight, it's just our average encoder counts between our two motors. 
um, it's the difference between that and how many encoder counts we want for how far we want to go. If we're trying to turn, it's the difference of encoder counts between our left motor and our right motor, which corresponds to how far we've turned. Um, you see uh, the first term in there, Kp times EFT, that's just our proportional term. We're multiplying our error by a constant. And then to the right of that uh, is our derivative term. Um, you notice that in, you know, in an actual derivative, you have like a con it would be like a constant times the error times dt or like de dt. Um, here, we, I mean, we can't take continuous integrals. We have to do it in discrete intervals. Um, so normally, if you're like doing a Riemann sum or something, you have a dt value um, as of like how much time has passed since the previous value. Here, that's just lumped into our, our kd. Um, so we calculate the derivative by taking our current error and subtracting our previous error, which is just the error stored in a variable from the last time we called our PAD controller. And we just take the difference between that to see how much our error has changed since we last used PID and our PAD controller, multiply that by our derivative constant, then add that to our proportional term. And there you have your correction. Um, and also just to remember as a reminder, uh, you kind of have to play around with these KP and KD terms a lot. Uh, they're experimentally determined. They're going to be different for everyone just because everyone's motors are different. Um, so that's where those come from. Okay. So if you, if none, if all the other analogies have fallen flat, then I hope this last mathematical one will help uh, let it sink in a little more. Okay. So if you've taken physics in high school or here at UCLA, you might recognize this kind of equation. So PID is mathematically identical to a damped mass system. So uh, what that is, so let's say there's a spring on in a block sitting on a table. So you pull it back from equilibrium, it's gonna oscillate, then friction on the table, that's their damping, it's gonna eventually settle back down somewhere. So um, the equation for that, so uh, so if you're familiar, so Hooke's law, so it, the amount of force that your spring is exerting is proportional to the distance, so kx. So instead of displacement here, we have our error value uh, times some constant, which uh, so you think of kp as a spring constant. And then also um, when you, in order to apply damping, instead of just infinite oscillating, there's a, so you add this uh, derivative of your uh, displacement term. So in this case, the rate of change of our error uh, times some constant that's dependent on the system. So uh, in the spring system, damp spring system, that would be the friction between your uh, mass and the table. Uh, in this case, we just, we uh, experimentally determined an ideal KD value. So you can, if you want to think of PID in this way, um, the goal is to critically damp your system. And critically damped, so critical damping in physics, that's where uh, KP and KD, your spring constant and the uh, damping uh, of the system is perfectly set so that it reaches equilibrium or gets back to equilibrium as fast as possible. So um, the point of, experimentally finding KP and KD is to critically damp our system. Just instead of a damped mass system, it's your mouse in the maze. Okay, uh, before we go on, uh, does anyone have questions as to what what's going on or like how something works or is something un exceedingly unclear about anything here? Uh, to answer your question, Kat, uh, short answer is not really. You kind of just have to play around with it. There is a methodical way as in you want to start with KD is equal to zero and then tune K, KP uh, working that up until you get like until it works generally well. And then you add in the derivative term to make it so it it you remove those oscillations. But uh, it's a lot. It is just sadly just <laughs> playing around. Yeah, to, to answer that, uh, I I tried looking up like a more uh, methodical way of doing it. And there's like techniques like, oh, like Bradley said, describing how to uh, do the tuning. But as far as like getting those values without doing anything, 
like simulating you unless you had like a perfect simulation if you can't it's, you can't really know what those terms are uh without actually playing with your system so uh yeah that's unfortunate james <laughs> does anyone else have any other questions okay so far as the math um like bradley said our derivative like that's a calculus term but we are subtracting our current error from our old one so that's minus and then multiplying it by something then the error term for the proportional is just the error term itself so there's no operation being performed there so uh you'll be using this equation uh, when you actually go to implement pad um so let's see there's a little cheat sheet uh don't try to read this all or write it all down or whatever right now so while you, when you're while you're doing your assignment you'll be referring back to this a lot to kind of see like what should i be doing um bradley do you have anything to say about that um yeah i mean this is just kind of like a wall of text but just remember um uh just like play around with it a lot it's going to take a little bit of time um i would start when you're actually implementing this start by implementing your proportional derivative first or your proportional subsystem first and then go around to actually implementing the derivative one um you also want to remember so we have two p we have two individual sets of pid controllers so we have one to handle driving straight and we have one to handle turning so those are both two separate ones and then each one also contains a proportional and a new derivative term so if you think about it that's like four different subsystems that we all have to uh, work together get to get working together in order to do our full mouse control all right all right so summarize pid is a control system all that means is it takes input produces an output that helps you achieve some goal um different controllers make sense in different places uh, we didn't talk about this too much but um, in MicroMouse, we don't need an integral term. So use a proportional derivative controller. Tune your system to be critically damped, AKA doesn't oscillate, just gets to your target in a controlled manner. Um, we can control, we can combine controllers. So you can't just, you, you can't say, oh, I want to drive to some location, but I can't, uh, control of what my angle is. So you can do both at the same time. And then, uh, yeah, so we had these kind of abstract square animations, but um, they, they correspond pretty analogously to your mouse moving through the maze. So uh, before we talk about the assignment, just a quick comment. Uh, the first time I ever heard or learned about PID control, like it seems, like, I hope we did a good job of making it intuitive, but um, it, was, it wasn't perfectly intuitive to me at first. And I think this is one of those things that if you don't get it at first, don't worry, um, playing around with it and kind of, once you actually implement it and wrap your head around it, then it, once it, it'll, it'll click once you get your mouse working and driving straight. So um, that's, so speaking from personal experience, that's my comment on that. That said, I hope we did a, a decent job uh, or an okay job uh, explaining that. Yeah, I second that. It took me a while to fully understand what was going on. Um, Derek, that is a good question. Uh, I guess for those of you watching the recording, the question is instead of making it turn exactly 90 degrees, can we have it turn through a curve? That is a little bit more complicated to implement. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that, but basically that would involve using both your, your both your um, driving straight and your turning controller at the same time and finding a way to balance them. So it is, it is possible. Yeah. Okay, so as far as your assignment, uh, they're both gonna, there's two subparts um, since they're kind of distinct. The first one is moving in a straight line. Um, this, the second one looks like a huge leap above the first one, but what you'll find is that once you're able to, once you figure out how to move in a straight line, the second 
3.2 should actually probably, it'll probably take you less time to do than 3.1. So, um, yeah, you lay the foundations in assignment 3.1 of understanding PID, learning how to implement it. And then 3.2 is just taking that to the next step of learning how to use that also to turn. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all that said, um, that's all we got for you today. Uh, good luck with your assignment. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, our next lecture, we'll talk about another type of sensor and how to process its data, IRV on infrared sensing, sensor fusion. Uh, Riley and I will we'll stick around for a few minutes, answer any lingering questions. Uh, but um, yeah. Hope you guys enjoy and uh, enjoy your evening. There you go. Hey, do you want to stop the recording? Yes, I do. Awesome. Um.